Hello and welcome back to the FEM channel. Our next speaker will be Rajiv Gouray. Until last year, he was a professor at the Australian National University. And his talk will be about how the counting of elections with complex voting schemes, uh, if that happens electronically and, and uh, verifiably. After the talk, there will be a Q&A session, a live Q&A session here to ask questions, uh, post them in the IEC hack in channel, uh, hashtag rc3-fem in the rocket chat at uh, hashtag fem and in the Fediverse and Twitter with the hashtag rc3fem without the dash. Für unsere deutschen Zuschauer gibt es eine Übersetzung. Dafür müsst ihr im Webplayer unter Sprachenausfall von, translated auf, äh, von native auf translated umstellen und dann könnt ihr die simultane Übersetzung zuhören. And now enjoy the talk. Hello everybody, my name is Rajiv Gore. Um, I used to be a full professor at the Australian National University, I'm now emeritus. And this is joint work with Milad Gale, who was a PhD student with us until a couple of years ago, and Dirk Pattinson, who is an associate professor at the ANU. Um, just before I go ahead, all of the stuff that I'm talking about, the code and the verification and the proofs, are available here if you want them. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about a way that we can count complex voting schemes, for example, the single transferable voting scheme by computer, but in a way so that um, the results are both formally and publicly verifiable by pretty much anybody. Okay, so this is the overview. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about what end-to-end -end verifiabil end -end verifiability is in um, electronic voting, as it's known. Then I'll explain what single transferable voting is. Then I'll explain the parlous situation of computer counting in Australia. Then I'll explain a little bit about how interactive theorem proving works and then the work that we did in more detail. Now, there's a lot of stuff here, and so I'm, I need to give a flavor of everything rather than go into the depth of the details. So I hope you'll bear with me, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have in the chat session afterwards. So let's get going. Um, so in electronic voting, the gold standard is known as end-to-end -end verifiability. And the way that they achieve it is by three steps, which sort of feed into each other. So the first one is called cast as intended. And the idea is that a voter should be able to verify in some way that the electronic ballot that he or she is casting is actually what they intended. Right. So the idea here is to mimic a paper ballot, you know, because when you put a paper ballot in the box, you know exactly what you're putting in the box. But when you do electronic voting via some sort of computer terminal, you don't necessarily know what the computer is actually casting on your behalf. And so cast is intended is to make sure that your the electronic ballot really is what you meant it to be. And there are cryptographic ways to achieve that. Recorded as cast says that you must be able to provide public evidence that the ballot was not tampered with in transit, right? So it's all great. The electronic ballot is what you intended. But if there's a man in the middle attack, then the man in the middle can change the ballot in transit. And finally, there's the tallied as recorded. So the idea is that a voter can verify that the ballot was tallied, right? In other words, that the tallying program didn't just throw the ballot away, right? Now, these three things naturally form, you know, a cascade so that if you have cast as intended and then recorded as cast and tallied as recorded, you have end-to-end -end verifiability. And there are, you know, publicly available um, electronic voting systems that try to guarantee these things. Now, most of these um, solutions for the first two are cryptographic in some sense, you know, some sort of hashing, some sort of mixing 
I won't go into the details. Now, tallied is recorded is all well and good, you know, that you know that your vote was tallied. But what if the vote counting program contains a bug? So what you really want to know is that it was tallied correctly. And that's what we're trying to address in this work here. And the idea is called uh, software independence. And it goes back to Ron Rivest, one of the co-inventors of RSA. So the idea is that a vote counting program has to produce a tallying script, right? Some sort of evidence of what it was doing. And then what we do is we try and guarantee that if the tallying script is correct with some notion of correctness, then the result is correct with the appropriate notion of correctness. Okay, so there are two notions of correctness here. One is the correctness of the tallying script and the other is the correctness of the count. And what we do is we formally tie them together with this implication in line in idea two, right? So that's a formal implication which has to hold in logic. And then our claim is that it's trivial to write a program to check the tallying script. And I'm hoping to demonstrate that in the rest of my talk. Okay. So the idea is rather than verifying that every run of the vote counting program is correct, what we verify is that this particular run of the vote counting program is correct, right? The one that counted your ballots or the one that counted this election. And so this idea of this run is correct will come up through my slides a little bit. Okay, it's a new take on formal verification. All right, so what do we mean by a voting scheme? So the example that I want to deal with is single transferable voting. So it's basically a method for setting out, filling in and counting paper ballots, right? Of course, if you make it electronic, you still have to have an electronic voting scheme, but now we're out of the, um, the scope of what we've done. So we have a paper ballot and, for example, like this one here, it says that, you know, there are four candidates and I vote Charlie one, Dave two, Alice three, and I don't really care about Bob. Now, depending on the voting scheme, this can either be a legal ballot or not. So, for example, do you have to fill out all the numbers? So in some jurisdictions, this would be an illegal ballot because I haven't put a four here. But in other jurisdictions, this is allowed. In, a, in the Australian Capital Territory in Canberra, where I am, what we do is we also do something called Robson rotation. And the idea is that if you just have a fixed order of the candidates, then the donkey vote, right, the voter that doesn't care, will just go one, two, three, four vertically. And that those donkey votes will all go to Alice. And, and unfortunately, we have a lot of donkeys in Canberra, and so there are lots of votes that are donkey votes. So what they do is they produce reordered versions of these ballots in all the possible permutations and distribute them to the physical locations in equal numbers. So the idea is that, you know, the donkeys get equally distributed through all of the candidates. The main thing that we need to do, of course, in counting is detect when a quota is, uh, is when a candidate reaches a quota. If someone doesn't reach a quota, then detect who the weakest candidate is, because that's who we're going to um, eliminate. And how do we break ties? And how do we transfer a vote? And when to stop counting? So as you can see, this has got nothing to do with the cybersecurity aspects of electronic voting, right? It's about formal verification of an algorithm. And I'm going to go into the details of STV counting now to explain why it's hard. So these are all the details, all the technical terms that I might use. And I'm just going to talk about how we count the ballots and refer to these things. So I'm going to let you read these. Just note here that the transfer value of a ballot can be less than or equal to one. That's the main thing that I want to get across. OK, so here is here is our pile of ballots. And what do we do? We do the following. We tally all the highest prefer preferences. So what does that mean? That means that we create a pile of ballots for Charlie, and this ballot goes into Charlie's pile, and that's it. Then 
we take the next ballot off the pile and put it into wherever the one uh, candidate is. So at the end of that, what we're going to get is we're going to get, in this case, four piles, one for Alice, one for Bob, one for Charlie and one for Dave. And every pile in every ballot in Charlie's pile will have a one here. And every ballot in David's pile will have a one here. And every ballot in Alice's pile will have a one here and so on. So the idea is that we've counted the first preferences. Now, if anyone meets the quota, if uh, whatever we fix the quota to be, then they're elected. I'll explain how that's done in a moment. But if nobody's elected, then we have to choose a weakest candidate and eliminate that candidate. And either way, whether we elect a candidate or we eliminate a candidate, we have to transfer their um, ballots. So let me explain what transferring means. So suppose that in the first count, Charlie is elected. So what we want to do now is we want this ballot to go into Dave's pile. But typically, we don't let it go into Dave's pile with a full value because Charlie is, the, this voter has already got his or her preference by having Charlie elected. And now allowing them to have a full vote to elect Dave is sort of giving them more power. So the idea is that we attenuate the value of this ballot in some way and the ballot value becomes less than one. I'll explain more in a moment. Um, of course, if the number of candidates that are remaining um, is, is um, less than the number of seats that we need to elect, then you can just elect everybody. Okay? So that's also done in the ACT where I live. Let me go into the details a bit more. So here's an example. So we have four candidates, A, B, C, and D. We have to run an election where we have to elect two of them. And here are the five ballots in the election. So A1, B2, D3, similarly, D1, C2, C1, D2. That's what these ballots represent. Let's assume that there are no fractional transfers for the moment. So we don't uh, attenuate the value just to keep things simple. And let's not do this autofill thing, right, where um, we elect all of the candidates if there are less candidates than the seats. It just keeps things simple for my example. Now, in Canberra, what we use is something called a droop quota, named after a person, and it's defined to be this. It's the total number of ballots, which is five, divided by the number of seats plus one, which is three, and it's the floor function, right? So it's the greatest integer that's less than that, plus one. So what does that mean? It's five divided by three is one point something. The floor is one, plus one is two. So as soon as someone gets two um, votes in this election, they get elected. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to count all the first preferences. So I'm going to go down here and count all the first preferences. So as you expect, we should get a three for A, a one for D, and a one for C. So here they are, right? There's a three for A, a one for D, and one for C. Now what? Now what we have to do is see whether anybody meets the quota. Well, A does meet the quota, right? A has three ballots and the quota is two ballots. So A actually has one ballot more than the quota. So let's elect A. Now what we have to do is decide what are we going to do with the surplus? So what was the surplus? Well, the surplus is one because A only needed two of these ballots to get across the line but A has got three. So the surplus is one. We have to decide how to transfer the surplus. There are various ways, which I'll come back to a bit later, but right now, I just want to keep things simple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, all these ballots are identical. So let's just delete two of them and transfer the third. So let's just delete the first two and transfer the third. So what's going to happen? is this ballot is now going to move from A's pile to B's pile. So B's count should go up by one. And that's exactly what happens. Now we have a three-way tie. Nobody's elected because nobody meets the quota. So we have to eliminate the weakest candidate. 
How are we going to choose the weakest candidate? Where well, again, there are various ways and it makes a difference. But for simplicity, let's just pretend that this ballot, because it's transferred, is somehow worth less than these ballots, which are not transferred, right? I'm just making something up, but there are much better ways, of course, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now transfer, I'm going to eliminate, um, eliminate A, sorry, I'm going to eliminate B and transfer the ballot, right? So I've eliminated B and transferred the ballot to D, but D now gets two votes, right? So we had B equals one, D equals one. We eliminated B, the vote went to D, so D's count goes to two. He, meet, he or she meets the quota, and so D is elected. And that's it, that's the end of the election, because we were tasked with electing two people, we elected two people, we eliminated B, and C is just left hanging um, as, well, neither elected nor eliminated, but um, the winners are A and D. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is tell you a little bit about the sad state of affairs of electronic vote counting in Australia. Um, we don't have any official electronic voting as such. We have booth-based voting in the ACT, but I just want to talk about vote counting. So at the highest level, we have the Australian Election Commission, which counts the federal elections, the national elections. And as you can see here, the code is hidden, it's proprietary, it's not available for scrutiny. When a lawyer in Tasmania put in a freedom of information request that the code be published, he was denied by the Australian Electoral Commission on the grounds of security and commercial inconfidence. He appealed the decision to something called the Arbitration Commission. And the Arbitration Commission threw out the defence of security because the code is just run in-house, right? It's not connected to the internet in any way. But they um, maintained the commercial in confidence argument and denied the freedom of information request. Now, what you should be asking yourself is why would the highest electronic authority, uh, sorry, election authority in Australia have commercial in confidence reasons for keeping their code secret? And it's because they make roughly $19 million a year by running elections privately for electing the directors of companies. And they don't want to endanger that business. So what they're choosing to do is they are choosing to deny the public the right to see the code, which is used to elect their representatives in the national government because they want to make a profit on the side. The Victorian Electoral Commission also has some proprietary code. Victoria is the state where Melbourne is, also has some proprietary co code. As far as I know, it's available for scrutiny, but as far as I know, nobody has done any scrutiny. The situation that I'm most familiar with is the Australian Capital Territory, where the code was developed by a company called Software Improvements using C++. It's been used four times since the 2001 election. And up until recently, the counting code, not the casting code, but the counting code was available from the website. But in the last election, which happened uh, in 2019, they decided to keep that secret as well. Of course, the full code is available if you're willing to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which says you shall not publish until we give you permission to publish. But being, you know, good academics, we're not willing to do that. The other province that I know of is the New South Wales Electoral Commission. New South Wales is the province where Sydney is. So they make on their, or at least a couple of years ago, on their, bit, on their website, you could get detailed um, functional requirements. There was a letter from a legal expert at the Queensland University of Technology to say that he or she thinks that the functional requirements meet the legislation. Then the code was certified by a company called BirlaSoft, which I'm assuming is an Indian company because I know that Birla is a big company in India, um, as passing all tests. But when you look at their certificate, the very first line says, we give no guarantees that the code does what it's supposed to do. We just check this, this, this and this, and you know, it's all okay. 
its proprietary code. When we asked for um, the code, they denied us the code and it's not available for scrutiny. Okay, so what? how can we sort of abstract the approaches? Because I want to try and keep things in the abstract. So the idea here is that let's look at three aspects. So let's look at the artifacts that exist, the scrutiny that we can place them under, and lacking the scrutiny, where is the trust, the blind trust that we have to place? So we have, you know, a 14 page document which outlines what the Hare Clark Act is in, Australia, in Canberra for how to count votes according to single transferable voting. And the, Australia, the Australian Capital Territory Electoral Commission and Software Improvements, the company, have come up with these functional specifications in UML. They're not published but presumably I could get them if I was willing to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So here we have to trust Software Improvements and the Election Commission. Then Software Improvements have produced the computer code in C++. They're not willing to publish the code. Well, they used to publish the counting code, but they're not even doing that now. And so what we have to do is we have to trust this auditing by some company called BMM. So in Canberra, the company that um, certified the code or audited the code is called BMM. Now, why on earth should you trust this BMM company? What do they do? Well, BMM is a company that actually audits gaming machines. So I I'm assuming you have them in Germany as well, but we have these things which we call one arm bandits. So, you know, these machines that you put money into and they tell you, they roll the dice and tell you whether you've won the jackpot or not. Now in Australia, the legislation says that they have to return some percentage of their takings. You know, 85% has to be returned to the players. Um, so this company actually audits gaming machines and certifies them to be, you know, correct in the sense of returning 85% of their takings. So at some stage, they decided that, well, if we um, audit gaming machines, why don't we audit software as well? And so they audit software. Um, again, the very first... Um, page of their certificate says we do not give any guarantees that this code actually counts the ballots properly. In New South Wales, they have a similar approach. So again, legal text, they have 47 pages of specs, but they're actually published. Um, there was a vendor, we don't know who, produced the computer code. The computer code is proprietary, you can't look at it. But now we have to trust this company called Billersoft. And again, the very first page is we don't guarantee that the code does what it was supposed to do. Now, what's the situation? So over the past 20 years, we've found many bugs in the ACT system, and some of my colleagues have recently found bugs in the New South Wales system. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the bugs. So the very first bug that we found was a simple for loop error. You know, what you want is a for, an outermost for loop that says something like, you know, for i equals one to the number of candidates do blah 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 now they had a slight bug in that so they either had n minus one or n plus one i can't quite remember which but one of our phd students who now works for google zurich found that um, the code would run perfectly fine if there was an even number of candidates but would just crash and burn if there was an odd number of candidates i can't remember which way it would have actually happened we found the bug three days before these people were going to count the ACT 2001 election live on television on the day of the election. Um, they admitted the error, they fixed it, but we got this nice letter back from the election commission saying, thank you for notifying us of this simple error. It was easy to fix and everything's fine now. So we asked them, well, if there was this simple error, how do you know there are not other errors? And they said, no, 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 we're sure, everything's fine. Of course, a little bit later, one of my colleagues, Alwyn Tu, found another bug. Um, that's this one here. He had, there was an uninitialized Boolean and different compilers could give different results. Another one of my colleagues, Jeremy Dawson, rewrote um, the implementation or rewrote his own implementation using a functional programming language and when we checked the results of the 2001 election, we found that three ballots were going in a slightly different way at a certain point. 
And we tra when we traced it, what we found is that there was a three-way tie, right, for the weakest candidate. So in a real election, there was a three-way tie where there were three candidates, all with equal number of votes, and one, none of them who met the quota, and one of them had to be chosen as the weakest candidate. Now, the, the legislation says that when you're in this situation, you've got a three-way tie, you go back and go back to the previous rounds until all candidates have an unequal number of votes. Now, Jeremy's a mathematician. So what he said is, what does that mean? Well, all candidates have an unequal number of votes means no two candidates have the same number of votes, right? So what this English text actually means is that all the ballots have to be, counts have to be pairwise distinct, right? So they're equal. We have to go back until this one is not equal to this one, this one is not equal to this one, and this one is not equal to this one, pairwise distinct. But the, AC, the EVAX code wasn't doing that. What it was doing is going back until one of them was different. So we wrote to the election commissioner and said, look, we think we found a problem. Your code doesn't meet the legislation. And he wrote us a very nice letter saying, thank you very much, but we've defined the meaning of this English text to be exactly what the code, our current code does, right? Well, we can't argue with that. He was the election commissioner. Um, how bad were these things? Well, for every bug, we could generate a very small election, which we could demonstrably show gave the wrong result. But they just said, we have full confidence in our code. The University of Melbourne group found a, a bug in the New South Quote in the New South Wales code recently, which actually reduced the chances of a candidate winning from 90% to 10%. Now, the first question you should be asking is, why are we talking about probabilities here when we're talking about an election? And this is worth discussing. So let me go back to here, where I had to uh, transfer one of these ballots. Okay, so remember that um, A has been elected, a has got a surplus of one, and I need to transfer these one of these three ballots. So what we did was we just transferred one of them because they were all equal. What New South Wales does is something really clever. They randomly select one of these ballots to transfer and transfer that randomly selected ballot, which is all fine in this case because they're all equal. But if these things were different, then we'd basically be flipping a coin to see who gets elected. And more importantly, what it means is that you can't rerun the count because your random number generator may do different things at the same position in the second count. So what did my colleagues do? What they did is they ran the election 100 times. And what they found is that one particular candidate was winning in 90% 90, 90 of their runs. But in the real election, there was a bug and it reduced the chances of that person winning to 10%. But the person couldn't challenge the result because the three-month period for a legal challenge had passed. So, you know, this poor person potentially lost the election because of a bug, but she couldn't challenge. Um, now I want to talk about a better way of doing things. So I'm switching now, right? So this is the parlour state of electronic voting counting in Australia. I want to try and talk about how to do it properly. But in order to do it properly, we need something called formal ver verification. And so what I want to do is tell you a little bit about formal verification and what that means. So formal verification started in the 60s with an AI dream, right? So the artificial intelligence researchers were dreaming about automating mathematics. So the idea is that we can do mathematics fully automatically on a computer. And you can read a really nice paper by a guy called, um, one of the authors is um, um, John Harrison, who is an expert in this formal verification um, area. And he currently works for Amazon. Why? Because they want to do formal verification of their code eventually. Of course, what they found is that, you know, Automating mathematics is the ultimate. Um, um, oops, just give me a second. Automating mathematics is the ultimate undecidable problem, and so uh, human guidance was indispensable, right? 
So they tried for 10 years and basically realized that we needed to be interactive. It couldn't be automatic. Now, the reasons why you might want to automate mathematics began to get more and more serious. So for the first example was the apple Harkin proof of the four color theorem. Um, this is the famous theorem that says you take any map in 3Ds um, of countries and you can color it in four, in at most four colors uh, so that no two countries have the same um, adjacent, no two adjacent countries have the same color. So Apple and Harkin came up with a proof in 1976, and there were some 1,500 lines of code, and people were asking, is the code correct? And they said, well, we think it is, but what can we do? The best example that I know of is the Pentium bug in 1994, because it cost Intel half a, mil half a billion dollars. So they then um, started hiring people in formal verification and they had a team for many years and john harrison actually used to work for intel for a number of years before he moved to amazon the next example is called the kepler conjecture this was approved by thomas hales that the best way of stacking oranges is the face centered cubic um, uh, way it's the way that your average greengrocer at your uh, market stacks them, but there was no proof that this was the most space efficient way of um, stacking oranges. He came up with a proof, but it had 200 pages of handwritten notes or type notes and a three gigabyte computer disk of, you know, examples. So again, the journal said, well, we're not sure about this, but, you know, we think it's okay. So what's the idea of formal proof? The idea of formal proof is that we use computers to do logic-based checking of proofs. So we enter the proof into a computer using a specially designed language, and the computer checks whether the proof is correct or not. Now, as you can see, this is a chicken or egg problem because how do you know that the computer program is correct? And that's what I wanna talk a little bit about now. This is actually a very um, well-developed area of research. And the current goal, there are many proof assistants, but the current goal is actually to make them more human friendly. So let me talk a little bit about um, formal proof. And I'm gonna do that using an example. So let's take the example of odd and even numbers. So what's the definition of an even number? Well, it's a number which can be divided by two. So it can be written, n is even, if it can be written as two times some other number, right? So for example, zero times zero, one times two, two times two, three times two, and so on. What's an odd number? Well, an odd number is just an even number plus one, right? The odd numbers are sitting in here. So it's zero plus one, two plus one, four plus one, five plus one, and so on. So now I want to prove a lemma. If the natural number n is even, then the natural number n plus 1 is odd. So how can I do that? Well, here's a simple proof. How does it proceed? So what we do is we say, okay, let's assume that n is even. That means that there's some k such that n is equal to 2 times k. So we know that this holds for our even number n. Well, now what we'll do is just we'll add 1 to this and one to this. And what will we get? We'll get that n plus one is of the form two times k plus one. But what do we know about numbers of the form two times k plus one? Well, they're odd by definition. So n plus one must be odd. All right. Now, what I want to do next is to show you an example of a computer script where a computer um, program called COC, which is a theorem prover, an automated proof assistant, has proven this, uh, has checked the proof. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Now, I can't go into the details, of course, but the idea is this, that we import some library called arithmetic because they've defined a library which allows us to do arithmetic. We define that for the natural number n is even if what? Well, if there's a k such that n equals 2 times k, the natural number n is odd if what? There exists a k such that n equals 2 times k plus 1. And here is an encoding of the lemma. For all natural numbers n, if n is even, then n plus 1 is odd. And this is the proof. 
Again, I can't go into the details, but these are commands that I've given to the interactive theorem prover. These are comments where I've tried to capture what line of the previous proof I'm capturing here. And the idea is that when I get down to here, I type QED and the computer program is checking all these steps. And it says, yes, all the steps are correct. Or it says, no, this step is wrong here, fix it up. And so the idea is that we interactively push the proof through. I can't go through the details. Okay, next question you should be asking is why should we trust machine check proof? So what we do is machine check proof is based on the Alonzo Church's Lambda calculus from the 1930s. It's a published paper. It's been reviewed for the last, goodness knows, almost 90 years or so by mathematicians. The official um, research laboratory called INRIA from France has produced this Koch theorem prover, which is about 50,000 lines of code. It's been in development since 1976. It's been checked by lots of people and everything is published. And so, yes, we do have to trust some of these things, but you can, you can actually check these things. So the idea is that we're going to use this framework to do um, formally verified electronic counting. So here's a map of what we've done. So what we did is we took the legal text, that's the English 14 pages of the Hare Clark Act, we manually transferred it into logic as rules capturing the state transitions of an automaton, right? So basically the state transitions where a computer moves from this state to that state and we tried to keep the computer as simple as possible, right? So we're not trying to mimic a full computer, we're trying to mimic some sort of abstract machine. We're capturing an abstract machine in logic. Then we converted this legal text into formulae of higher order intuitionistic logic as our fun functional specification. So this is logic and this is logic. And what we proved in Koch is that if this thing produces a correct certificate with some notion of correctness, then this thing produces a correct count with the appropriate notion of correct count. Again, I can't go into the details, but I'll try to give you an example in a minute. Now these, um, the Koch Interactive Theorem Prover is so well developed that actually we were able to extract the code automatically, which I can't go into, right? So the idea is that once you do a proof in Koch and Koch accepts the proof, you can generate the code automatically. So we didn't write any code. We just did a proof and we pressed a button. Why should you trust any of this? Well, everything's published, right? You can get your election expert to check this. You can get your mathematical logician from TU Darmstadt, say, to check this. And the only thing you really need to, to trust is the certificate, which we're going to publish, and you can check. So that's what I want to go into now. So what have we done? We've completed STV vote counting and also the Schulze method. The Schulze method is used, for example, by the Linux community when they want to decide which way to um, fork branches. Our code computes with extract, exact fractions. It's efficient. We can count up to 10 million votes with 40 candidates and 20 vacancies in 20 minutes. It produces a, a certificate. It produces a paper printout of the state machine and what states it's going through. And what we claim is that an average third year computer science student can write a program to check the certificate. And that's what I want to go into uh, in a moment. In, in reality, you don't even need to trust the hardware or the software, because all you need to do is check whether the certificate is correct, because our proof guarantees you that a correct certificate implies a correct count, right? And the converse of this is that incorrect count means incorrect certificate. So if you check the certificate, you can check with the count. So this is what I want to talk about now. So what we actually did is we uh, encoded a minimal abstract machine, which has three types of states. There's an initial state where all the ballots are uncounted. There's a final state where we declare winners. And then there are a bunch of intermediate states. I can't go into the details, but the idea is that these intermediate states carry complicated data, which are usually lists. And ballots are moving from one list to another list according to the state transitions of this machine. And the state transitions correspond to counting, eliminating, transferring, electing, and declaring winners as rules. 
And so, you know, the machine moves from this state to this state if you count. It moves from this state to this state if you eliminate. And that's captured in logic. Um, then what we did is we, we actually proved minimal conditions that the rules need to satisfy for the, everything to be correct. Now, I can't go into the details of this, but what I want to do is give a simple example. So let's go back to that idea of the natural numbers. And what, we'll, what I'll do is I'll show you some coding which, which encodes the natural numbers into COC. So this is actual COC code. And it says to the COC theorem prover that capital zero is my type of natural number. I'm defining my private type of natural number. Capital, uh, capital O is a my type is a my type of natural number and s is a function which takes any natural num my nat that you give it and gives back another natural number so what does that mean it means that zero is capital o one is s of capital o two is s of s of capital o three is s of s of s of capital o and so on so every natural number is represented as a string which ends in capital o and has a number of s's in front of it so what we did is the state machine is encoded using this complicated thing. And what you can see here is, right, that there's some um, list, initial list of ballots, there's the final list of candidates which are elected, and then there's a complicated structure which captures these lists. Again, I can't go into the details. Um, the minimal STV instance is then given by the definitions of these rules and the rules that satisfy the respective conditions. The conditions consist of two parts. When is the rule applicable and how does it change the state? And then we, in COC, we prove the three theorems. Every applicable transition reduces complexity. So whenever you do something, you're reducing the complexity of what remains. That means that eventually we have to reduce the complexity to zero. There's a notion called liveness, which says from any state, you can't be blocked. There's always at least one exit. Right? And these two, two th things together imply that whenever you give me a set of ballots, my process will terminate. Right? So I guarantee you that this is an algorithm which terminates. Okay. Then what we did is we used the code extraction facilities of COC to actually extract the code, which I can't go into. And what we did is produce a program that actually produces a certificate. And what's the certificate? It's a run of the state machine. And what we claim is that it's easy to write a program to check the certificate. Again, I can't go into the details, but I'll give you an example. So going back to our natural numbers, I claim that this is a certificate of correct addition, All right? So what is it? It's just a stack of lines of the form add something, 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 okay? And in the same way, this is a certificate produced by our vote counting program. And as you can see, it's a bunch of lists. So this is a ballot which says A preferred over C preferred over B, and it moves in some way through the lists until we declare a winner. Okay, I can't go into the details, but this is what's going on. So the claim is that to check the certificate, all you need to do is simple pattern matching and check that these actually are the rules that are being used to go from here to here, where these are the rules, add zero and add S, in this case, right? But in our case, it would be the start and count rules. So now I want to go to, into an example. So keeping the example simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to define the natural numbers, as I said, and we're going to say that a basic derivation is any string of this form. That is a string that starts with the word add, and has three things after it, all of which are x, y's, and z's. But the first one has to be equal to the third one, and the middle one has to be big O. And why is that? Well, because that just says that adding zero to x is x. And we know that adding zero leaves x alone. And then the step case says, if you know that adding x to y gives z, then you know that adding x to y plus one gives z plus one. And so all we're doing is we're inserting S twice into this position and this position to convert that to an S of Y and convert that to an S of Z, right? So what's a derivation? It's a stack of correct derivations. 
then the result is in the bottom. And the theorem says a correct derivation always contains a correct result. How can you verify that? Well, I claim that this is a correct derivation. So let's check. Is this a correct derivation? Yes, because it's something and the same thing with a big O in the middle. That was the correct definition. And it says that 0 plus 1 equals 1. This one is a correct definition because if this is a correct derivation, then all we've done is added an S here and added an S here. And this thing says you can transform one correct derivation into another correct derivation. So this is a correct derivation. What's the result? 1 plus 1 is 2 and so on. What's the final result? 1 plus 3 is 4. So all you need to do is you, all you need to check are those rules that I took, that, that, that I specified up here. And it's just a pattern matching problem. So what, what's the election process? So what we do is we publish our logical encoding of the vote counting process. We publish the specification of what correct certificate means. We publish the mathematical proof that a correct certificate implies a correct result. What does the software vendor do? The software vendor delivers a program, which is almost certainly buggy, for vote counting. But it has to produce a correct certificate. It has to produce a certificate according to what we mean to be a certificate and what we mean to be a correct certificate. Now, of course, if the program is buggy, it may not do that. So the election authorities have to publish all the ballots. Now what can we do? Well, now we can have very, very widely available scrutiny. Because look, the political parties can each hire a third-year computer science student to write a certificate checker. What's a certificate checker program? They just look at what a correct certificate means and what a certificate means and encode what it means for the certificate to be correct. It's pattern matching. Other academics could set a software engineering project to cite a certificate checker. So what we could have is we could have lots and lots of certificate checkers which have been independently developed. And it's highly unlikely that all of them will contain the same bug. Right? So what do we do? Well, you run the election, everybody checks, and someone says the public certificate is incorrect. So what we say, okay, you claim that the public certificate is incorrect. Where does it break the correctness criteria? Right? We told you what it meant to be correct. You tell us where it's incorrect. And if you tell us that it's incorrect in line 50, uh, 35, so I don't know, it's incorrect in going from here to here, well, we can check that, right? So there's public checking of that claim. Then someone else says, oh no, your mathematical proof is wrong. So we'll say, all right, you claim the mathematical proof is wrong. Tell us where it breaks the rules of logic. We've published our rules and we've published our proof. So you could go to the people in Berlin or Darmstadt or Karlsruhe and get the academics there to check our proofs. Someone else might say the correctness criteria or the mathematic mathematical encoding is wrong. Again, we say, all right, when you claim something is wrong, give us an example of where it does something wrong and we can check. So the electoral experts can check. Finally, what if the vote canning program is buggy or hacked, right? We don't care because the theorem says that the correct certificate implies the correct result. So the contrapositive says incorrect result implies incorrect certificate. And we've got all these thousands of people around Germany checking the certificate, right? So what it says is that the bug or even the hack could not have manifested itself during this run of the program. Right? The hacker tried to do something, or the vendor had a bug in their program, but that bug did not manifest itself during this run. So this run is correct. That's the idea. So what have we done? We've completed STV counting. As I said, we've completed the Schulze method, counts 10 million votes, blah, blah, blah. Right? Our certificate is a plain text certificate, which uh, vouches for the correctness of the count. And you don't even need to trust the hardware or software because there are all these certificate checkers written by independent people um, who will check the certificate. Now, the only caveat, the dangerous one, is that we have to publish all ballots. And that's actually a problem because what is known is that if you publish ballots, then the election can be vulnerable to something called a Sicilian attack, which I won't go into for now. What we've actually done is 
Millard has even verified the certificate checker. So he has produced a, a verified certificate checker, which is formally correct with respect to the semantics of C, using a different theorem prover, interactive theorem prover for cake ML. We've had, we can cover all the STV schemes used in Australia. And the problem that we're really interested in now is can we do this to encrypted ballots? Because that would remove this is the attack. So the message that I want to try and get across to you in Germany is verified and publicly verified e-counting is now possible. Thank you for your attention. Hello and welcome back and thank you for the nice talk. As someone in the chat mentioned after hearing uh, STV for the, like before hearing of STV for the first time, they thought the German electoral system was complicated. As a reminder, we have a Q&A session now. If you want to ask questions, you can ask in the IRC at rt3-fem, in the Rocket Chat at fem, and in the Twitter and Fediverse at rt3-fem. And now, uh, welcome uh, to the Q&A session. Uh, Rajiv should join us now. Yes, he is here. Hello and welcome. Hi. Okay, we actually do have quite, quite a few questions. I'm positively surprised about that. Uh, and uh, the first one is, um, are there similar movements to public court, uh, money public code uh, in Australia? And, uh, or is, if, there, if, if there are, is there any international cooperation between these movements? Uh, and how do you do these play into arguing against closed source voting court? So, so the first one is uh, about international cooperation. And as far as I know, there isn't any. The only cooperation there is is between academics like myself. So there are groups in Karlsruhe, there are groups in France, uh, in INRIA, and there are various other groups around the world that are trying to push the election commissions to take up our technology. The biggest problem that we have is that the election commissions are not sophisticated um, acquire sorry are not acquirers of sophisticated software right so they're not like NASA or they're not like you know the the space commissions um, they go out to tender and you know if a vendor says our code is correct then they just say well okay yeah the code is correct the vendor says so right um, and what was the second question sorry the how was I going to argue uh, how, how do these play into arguing against closed source voting code? So I think it was more about the the, the push to to get the public get the voting code and uh, the, the counting code published. Right. So so what's going on here is it's a strange um, confluence of interests. So the election commissions have built up a lot of trust over the last hundred years. And the last thing they want is to have their trust undermined. So what they don't want is they don't want academics like uh, jumping up and down saying there's a bug in your uh, code, there's another bug in your code. And so what they prefer is to say our vendor guarantees us that everything is fine, trust us. And this is only going to change when there actually is a disaster and somebody a losing candidate challenges the result and it goes to court and you know the case is thrown out and they have to run the election again and it's going to cost them you know a couple of million dollars and be very embarrassing so the only time this will change is when there's a disaster unfortunately um, and what we have found around the world is there are many academics like myself jumping up and down saying look we need to do formal verification and almost all of them have been ignored by the election commissions for the reasons that i just explained well that sounds like the concept of security by obscurity is still popular in yeah, some absolutely in some yeah, source yeah. absolutely yeah, yep. trust us yep. <laughs> okay then uh, maybe we get to the next question uh, regarding the bugs in the counting modules, were there any requirements on the code quality to avoid common mistakes, for example, by forcing compiler warnings to be treated as errors or using static analyzers? 
I don't know. <laughs> they won't tell us. All they tell us is that we've tested the code extensively and it passes all our tests. Now, you have to understand where the election is coming from here. So, in the old days, they used to count ballots by hand. Right now in Canberra, we have about 350,000 voters. And so, you know, they needed to count these votes quickly by hand to, to declare the election. And what happened is that in 1996, there was actually a challenge. And it went down to some very small number of votes, you know, three votes or something like that. And so candidate A was declared the winner, candidate B challenged. So they had to do a recount by hand, which took a week. Then the result went the other way. Candidate B was the winner by five votes, say, and, challenge, and candidate A challenged. So then they had to do another recount, which took another week. And in the end, I can't remember the result, but, you know, it took three or four weeks to um, uh, give the results, the final results, which were challenge-free. And so at that time, the ACT Electoral Commissioner said, look, this is silly. There's got to be a better way. Let's do it by computer counting. But of course, what he or she doesn't realize is that by doing it by computer counting, you're putting all your eggs in one basket, right? You have a single point of failure and you're putting a lot of trust on that single point of failure. And that's what we're not able to get across to them. Okay, so thank you. Uh, okay, the next one is, uh, have you proved the cock to Haskell compiler to be correct? And are you certain that you don't end up with the false as prediction with false as a precondition anywhere. Right. So this is the classic thing of um, formal verification, which is garbage in, garbage out, right? So if our formulas are inconsistent, then we can prove anything we like. And no, there is no proof that cock is consistent. There could well be some sort of serious logical error in our, in our formal uh, coding. But at the end of the day, we have a proof that a correct certificate implies a correct count, right? Which you can check. So even though there may be a problem in cock, we can tell you that that bug in cock didn't manifest itself in our proof, if our proof is correct, and you can check the proof, right? So this is classic peer review, scientific peer review. You know, okay. string theory might be wrong, but it passes all the tests that we can throw at it at the moment because it pa passes all the experiments that we can do. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I think the next question is not completely serious. Uh, it is, does anyone trust a third-year computer science student? <laughs> well, frankly, I wouldn't trust a third-year computer science from any Australian university, but I know that in, in Germany you teach them properly and, you know, a four diploma and a diploma is, is non-trivial, so I trust German third-year computer science students. Okay, I guess a lot of viewers will be happy about that answer. <laughs> okay, um, um, the next one is to what degree do voters trust these voting machines. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if, if there were any voting machines in the talk, but I guess you have a better qualified to answer it. Right, so in Canberra, um, as I said, we don't have any electronic voting, you know, by your, by your tab, tablet or something like that, right? What we have is you go into a booth and the booth has a computer with a screen and you prepare, you know, you press the buttons, I think it's a touch screen, you press the you know, you touch the screen to create your ballot and then you say, you know, yes, this is the ballot that I want to submit. And you, then you get a nice friendly uh, screen that says, thank you very much, your, your ballot has been cast and, you know, trust us, right? Now, what people should be asking is, how do you know that the ballot that you show on the screen is the one that you're actually casting? How do you know that the machine isn't making a mistake and casting, you know, vote one Raj uh, every time? Um, and unfortunately, the average voter is not sophisticated enough to ask these sorts of questions. And so what they do is they say, well, you know, I can't check a pen and paper election. Who do I trust? I trust the election authority. And in this case, I do the same. I don't know enough about computer computers to know that what's on the screen is what's being cast, but I trust the election commission to have done their job. 
Okay, yeah. So um, another one wants to, to know uh, how can you clarify, uh, or if you can clarify whether and how you distinguish e-counting from e-voting. Right. So if you remember right at the beginning, I gave you this idea of end-to-end -end verifiable voting, right? Do you remember there was this cascade? There was cast. There was um, there was cast as intended. There was um, collected as cast and counted as collected. So the idea of electronic voting is that you have all of these, right? So you know you cast your ballot on your tablet, somehow the tablet has to give you evidence that what you created on the tablet was actually the electronic ballot that was cast. Then, you know, the, the tablet sends the ballot somehow magically over the Ethernet to the election authority, and the election authority has to produce some evidence that you can verify that the electronic ballot wasn't tampered with in transit. And finally, when the election authority publishes a result, they have to provide some evidence, publicly verifiable evidence, that um, you can check to say that your ballot was actually in the count. Right now, so that's the traditional way of doing electronic voting. There are systems out there that do that. As I said, in Canberra, we have booth-based voting. So you cast your ballot inside a booth in privacy on a computer that they say works properly, then the ballot is somehow transferred to the election author authority, which they say is secure and everything is fine. They count the ballots according to their computer program, which they won't show us, and they assure us that everything is fine. So as you can see in Canberra, we have nothing. We have no ill-end to end verifiability because we have to trust the election commission or the vendor at every stage. Does that answer the question? I guess so. So basically, you're tackling this third of the three problems without and leaving the exactly. first two out of scope. Yep. Okay. So and, another. And there are cryptographic. There are crypt, There are incredibly intricate cryptographic methods to solve the first two. Okay. So another one was uh, in Germany. We have more more bizarre voting methods than single transferable votes. Any idea of if this would work with cumulative voting or pan? Sorry, Panacek or um, it's it's written. Panacea. Yes, <laughs> I Panacea, think so. Yeah. So, in other words, is it a solution for um, all situations? Um, the simple answer is I don't know. I haven't tried. But as I said, my colleagues in Karlsruhe, have, there's, a, there's a, a theoretical computer science group and a verification a formal methods group in Karlsruhe. Um, they would be the people to understand the German system. I'm sorry, I just haven't, uh, I just haven't had a look. Okay. Um, but I have, a, I have a reverse question. You said that the German system is a bit bizarre, but I mean, STV counting itself is pretty arcane as well, right? So does it get any more bizarre than STV in Germany? That's a good question. Um, as f I haven't looked into the into the uh, federal election system lately, but it didn't look so complicated to me. But it could be in the local elections that there are more complicated uh, voting systems. But that's just my unqualified answer. So there's probably sure. a lot more, a lot more qualified people there. So so what's known is that STV is actually one of the hardest. Okay, so there's an area called social choice theory where, you know, people, typically mathematicians, compare different voting schemes. And, you know, people have come up with many other alternatives to STV to try and make it fairer or better. And, you know, there are at least 10 different voting schemes that we could discuss. But STV is known to be one of the more arcane ones because, you know, everything depends on, for example, how do you break ties? How do you, you know, decide who's the weakest candidate and this sort of stuff? And for example, in the um, ACT system, the one in Canberra, there's actually a clause which says if everything is equal all the way up to the beginning, then the election commissioner can toss a coin or he or she can choose names out of a hat, right? So that, that's how, you know, bizarre it gets. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, so someone uh, noted that apparently these more bizarre voting systems appear in Bavaria, so like the, one of the southern states of Germany. Yeah, actually, yeah, I knew that Bavaria was a bit unusual. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, and so the last of the official questions, uh, how is the certificate generated? And the asker mentioned that he or she might have missed it the, during the talk. Um, the certificate is just a naive printout of the run of the state machine, right? So, uh, I mean, strictly speaking, you know, we could be cheating. What we could be doing is taking your ballots and randomly generating a certificate and claiming that this certificate correct contains a correct count. We might not even be running a, a program, right? Literally, we could have a thousand monkeys sitting on typewriters, randomly generating a certificate. And then after, I don't know, say an hour, we say, this is the certificate, right? And Raj wins. Um, but it doesn't matter because the proof says that if you can verify that the certificate is correct, then the count that it contains is correct. So it doesn't matter if we generate it using a random number generator. I mean, we don't, of course, but strictly speaking, we could. Okay, thank you. And one last question that we had in the studio here. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a little bit more about what was the problem with publishing the vote? You said there was this Sicilian attack, but yeah, that sure. Was... <laughs> okay, all right. So um, this goes back to the the mafia in Sicily, and that's why it's called the Sicilian attack, right? So what you want is you know um, you're running, you, you have an election for mayor, and you want to make sure that Raj gets elected because Raj is crooked, and you can bribe him and you know do what, get him to do whatever you want. So what you do is you tell the voter that I want you to vote in a particularly arcane way, right? So you vote Frederick three and Frida one and Raj seventeen and you know Jörg five or something like that um, and then what you do is if you publish the ballots you can check whether that ballot e exists you know is there a ballot that what was it Frida 17 Jörg five Raj 17 and uh, Fred one or whatever it was if that ballot is missing then you know that the voter didn't do as you asked and then you can you know either burn down their house or, you know, uh, shoot their children or whatever you've done to coerce them, right? And so in Australia, in STV, it's actually very plausible because, for example, you know, we have elections where there are 43 candidates and you can encode your ballot in many, many different combinations in to be unique. And so, you know, we ask you to vote in this way, and once the ballots are published, we check whether that particular perversely generated ballot is in there. And what we've done, of course, is made sure that we're scattering all the candidates except the one that we want to win and making them win. Does, does that help? Yes, for me it makes it makes it understandable. It basically breaks the basic assumption that any vote, you, like any, the way you vote is really actually secret. That's right. So you can uniquely identify a vote because of the complexity of the system. Yes. Okay, I th that means we're out of questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Raj, for, for, uh, for your talk and also for, for the very detailed answers. And uh, thank pleasure. you very much. Okay. okay. Right. And now on the FEM channel, uh, the next, ha the last thing for today happening is the Herald News Show at midnight. And tomorrow it continues or we continue at uh, 5 p.m. with uh, writing lecture notes directly in LaTeX. And then see you. Bye bye.